Hi, welcome back to our study of the book of Revelation. I know it's been a couple of weeks. I did those two chapters together because we traveled and we're glad to be home and we are getting back to it. We are on Revelation chapter 11. I'm going to read it to you from the NIV, the entire chapter it says. I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar and count the worshipers there. But exclude the outer court. Do not measure it, because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months, and I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, Fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. These men have power to shut up the sky, so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying, and they have power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Now, when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes from the abyss will attack them and overpower and kill them. Their bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, men from every people, tribe, language, and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. The inhabitants on the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other gifts, because these two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth. But after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them, and they stood up on their feet, and terror struck those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, while their enemies looked on. At that very hour, there was a severe earthquake, and a tenth of the city collapsed. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the survivors were terrified and gave glory to God, to the God of heaven. The second woe has passed. The third woe is coming soon. The seventh, trump, the seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who were seated on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your saints, and those who reverence your name, both great and small, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was open, and within his temple was seen the ark of his covenant, and there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a great hailstorm. <clears throat> so we finished... Uh, chapter 10 with John being told that he would have to prophesy again and being given a scroll which he had to eat a scroll that would be sweet as honey in his mouth but would turn bitter in his stomach and um, he was commanded that he would preach right, prophesy again about many people's nations languages and kings and so we have this idea of prophecy and that theme of prophecy carries on here into chapter 11. And we see a number of themes that you have to know uh, your scriptures to know what these themes are. Because we see the uh, temple, we see the Ark of the Covenant, we see these prophets doing things that we saw from the Old Testament. So we're kind of seeing callbacks to Old Testament teaching. We hear references to Sodom and to Egypt. And, um, and so there's a lot of references that you have to think of here as you're looking at this chapter. Now you need to remember we're still in between the sixth and the seventh trumpet. We're still in that interlude period. 
And so what happens here is we're following up on this theme of prophecy. John's told you're going to prophesy. And then the very next thing, he's given this read and told to measure. It's a, it's a measuring rod. And he said, go measure the temple of God and the altar and count the worshipers there, but exclude the outer court. Do not measure it because it has been given to the Gentiles. So John is called to go and see the temple and the worshipers. This would be the believers. This would be the church. And he's supposed to look at and measure all of it, but not the outer court which has been given over to the Gentiles. In this case, it's not talking about literal Gentiles, but outsiders, people who aren't part of the, the congregation. They aren't part of the community. It's been given to them, and they trample on the holy city. Now, there's some debate over whether or not the Gentiles in this and the outer courts is referring to believers or to unbelievers. And that's because in the Old Testament times, the outer courts were for Gentile people to come in. But the Gentile people that came in were people who were seeking God. And so people might say, well, if they're in the outer courts, they're people who are seeking God. It could be, or it could represent uh, non-believers who are outside. Um, you know, I just wonder also if there's something here about people who claim to be a part of the church, but aren't really. I wonder if, if that might be um, who these people are. But we see that they're, they trample on the holy city. These people trample on the holy city for how long? For 42 months. Now, this is another thing that's repeated throughout this chapter. 42 months. I'm not good at math. But 42 months, if there's 30 days in a month, is 1,260 days. Or three and a half years. So whenever you see 42 months, 1,260 days or three and a half years, it's the same period of time. And so you see something here that these people have been given an authority to trample on the holy city for 42 months. And at the same time, God has brought forward witnesses who are going to prophesy for that same amount of time. And so uh, this 42 months, is it literal? Probably not. It's probably symbolic. Most things that we see in Revelation are symbolic. And so it's very difficult to just take some things literally and some things as symbols when almost everything he's writing is using symbols. Now, people say, well, is a symbol real? Well, of course a symbol is real because a symbol is the thing that it represents and it is not the thing that it represents. In one sense, it's just a symbol, but in another sense, it is actually that thing. So for instance, like you take the, the flag of the United States, that's a symbol of this country. The flag is not the country, but the flag is a symbol that represents the country. But as that symbol, it has a seriousness and a power that makes people offended when people trample on it or burn it or treat it with disrespect. Why? Because it's just a symbol? No, because that symbol represents something very real. And in that sense, it is really. So in people's eyes, if you were to trample on the flag, you are trampling on the nation. And so for things to be symbols does not mean that they aren't real. In fact, they are very real things even if they aren't literally the thing that they represent. And so we see here that God brings forth two witnesses and they prophesy for 1,260 days and they're clothed in sackcloth. Uh, that represents mourning. Uh, when people would, would mourn, they would put on sackcloth and that's how they would show that they were mourning. And it says, these are two olive trees and two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And so if you remember earlier in Revelation, lampstands represented something. Lampstands represented churches. And so the question is, what are these two witnesses symbols of? And it's 
kind of the consensus these days of modern scholars that either it's two literal witnesses who are coming back during an end-time tribulation, or it is the church and the churches globally that give testimony of Christ and prophesy declaring God's truth to the world. Now, these two characters we see here have a power or powers. They're not like superpowers, but they have the ability to do things that prophets in the Old Testament did. And so clearly, John is wanting you to remember two specific prophets. He's wanting to remember Elijah, who called down fire from heaven, who uh, prayed and caused the heavens to, to close up so that there was no rain. And he wants you to remember Moses, who turned the waters of Egypt into blood. Now, does that mean that these two guys are Moses and Elijah coming back? I don't know. Um, in Jewish uh, lore, shall we say, they, they told stories about prophets that would come back, prophets that would return to prophesy. If you remember, people even asked John the Baptist, are you Elijah? Um, and then Jesus said, who do you think, who do you say I am? And he says, well, some people say you're Elijah or one of the prophets. So that was part of their thinking was that great prophets might come back. And so it seems like John is kind of taking that idea of these great prophets are going to come back, but it's not them coming back. It's the churches that stand firm and prophesy despite the fact that the temple's being trampled on. They're, they're prophesying in the midst of persecution. So what we see here in this vision is we're seeing the church being faithful and being a prophetic witness to Christ in the face of persecution. But they, they aren't defenseless. They have power. And so God gives them this power that they can, they can turn water into blood and throw fire from their mouth. They can call judgment down on those who oppose them. All right, why two? Why two prophets then if it's the churches? Well, here's a couple of thoughts. One, in Jewish thought, in their legal system, two witnesses were required to demonstrate something as true. And also, if you remember, Jesus sent his apostles out two by two. So here's some ways of looking at it. And, um, and so that, that could be why it's, it's two. But the majority of scholars today really are, are believing that these two prophets, if they don't refer to two specific prophets who are coming down during a special tribulation time, they represent the church faithfully proclaiming the truth of God in the midst of persecution and suffering and explaining. So it's almost like John is saying to the churches, you're going to prophesy. You're going to be facing these challenges. They're going to be coming and wanting to trample the grounds. But you're going to prophesy. You're going to do it faithfully. And you know what? You have the spirit of Elijah. You have the spirit of Moses. You have the authority of God to call judgment on these people. And then we see something really interesting happen. This is the first mention of the beast in Revelation. The beast rises up. And who does the beast attack? He attacks the witnesses. And he destroys them and he kills them. And their bodies lie in the street of the great city. Oh, here we have a great city. But this is a worldly city. And later we're going to see the city of God coming down from heaven. And so we have a contrast between the heavenly city and this city of evil. And he talks about this city, the great city. At the time, He's referring to Rome. Rome was the greatest city in, in the world. But he also says it's figuratively called Sodom. Well, Sodom was known for its moral, uh, what do you call it? Moral deficiency. They just 
it was a mess in Sodom. Sodom was just moral corruption. And then Egypt, the Jews were slaves in Egypt. So Egypt represents slavery. And then he talks about the city where Christ was crucified. And that's Jerusalem that has turned against God. So he refers not just to, to Rome, but this entire earthly system that is all about power, that's about moral depravity, that enslaves people and unjustly murdered the Messiah. And now here the beast has fought against the Messiah's witnesses and has overcome them and killed them in that city. And they lay there and the inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them. Then it says that people from every tribe, language, and nation gaze on their bodies. In other words, these people have witness to the entire world. And now the inhabitants of the earth are like, finally, we're done with these people. We don't have to put up with this. They have no more influence. They're gone. But just like the Messiah, they're vindicated by their death by God and their death. It says after three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them and they stood up on their feet and terror struck those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on. Here we have a picture of just like what happened to Christ. Christ died. The world thought they had victory. But in his death, he was vindicated by his righteousness and God raised him from the dead and the earth had to see it and trembles in fear. And the same thing is going to happen with the church. The church is going to suffer and in their faithfulness unto death. Again, I talked about how the word martureo the word martyr means witness by their faithfulness and persecution unto death. They are proven to be right when God raises them. And he says, and the world sees them. And at that hour, there was a severe earthquake and a 10th of the city collapsed. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake and the survivors were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. Now this doesn't say that they all of a sudden believed no, they were terrified and recognized, oh, crap, Phew, that's, that's God. <laughs> oh. This isn't a good thing. These people that are surviving this and they're seeing it, they're like, ah, they're in awe of God. So the beast, his weapon is death. But Christ has overcome death. What looks like defeat is actually victory because Christ has disarmed the beast. The beast's weapon has no power. The beast can do nothing to God's people. Oh, he can kill them, but God's going to raise them up. And there they were in Rome in the shadow of the Colosseum where 3,000 Christians died. It's pretty reassuring. And you know what? It was the witness of those 3,000 people dying in the Colosseum that convinced many people of the truth of the gospel. And so we saw this really happen in history. And this reminds me that the church has been called to be a prophetic witness to Christ. Now here's the thing. You might not have the office of of prophet you might not have the gift of prophecy but if you are a part of the body of Christ you have been called to give a prophetic witness to Christ so that's not the same thing as having the gift of prophecy it is living a life and declaring a message the message of God to the world that challenges the world that makes the world stop and look and say, I don't think I like this. It's challenging me. The world hates prophetic witness. The world turns against it. The world wants to kill it. And when prophetic witness is killed, the world celebrates. 
we have been called to prophetic witness. Every single one of us who belong to the body of Christ, whether or not we have the gift of prophecy. And the same is true for other gifts. For instance, you know, you've got offices of apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, teacher. Well, those describe the church entirely. And God has given people with those gifts to empower the church in order to do those things, to, to fulfill those roles. And just think about this also with prophecy. In Acts chapter 2, Peter said that what they were seeing, what they were witnessing when the Holy Spirit had been poured out was the fulfillment of what the prophet Joel had said. And that was that in the last days, God would pour out his spirit on all flesh and said, and your sons and daughters will prophesy. You will prophesy if you are in Christ. Even if you don't have the gift of prophecy, even if you aren't a prophet, your life and the words of your mouth, your testimony must be a prophetic witness to Christ. This is what you have been called to. And you know what? You have power as a part of the body of Christ. The body of Christ can pray and call down judgment on those who oppose what is right, on those who oppose what comes from God. Just like fire from their mouth or calling that the rain be stopped. I was reading a commentary and the author, it was uh, Craig Keener. He's a well-respected uh, theologian and uh, writer. And he said that he remembered that when he became a Christian, a, when he was young and in school, he and a couple of other young people, they were witnessing and witnessing and witnessing in the school. And the school was just, ah, I don't want to hear anything. And he said that six different people who had strongly opposed their witnessing died from different reasons over the course of a year. He said, and all of a sudden, the, the school was paying attention to the message because they said, wait a minute these people that were opposing this message, these things have happened to them and they're gone and these guys are still here. And he said that this was an example of how God does bring judgment on the world to reveal who he is and to reveal who his servants are. And so this isn't necessarily, I'm not saying that we need to be praying that people die, but we do need to be praying that God would show his judgment on what is evil and that God would prove our message to be true. And what did God do throughout um, the book of Acts and throughout the New Testament? There were miracles. There were great things happening. They were casting out demons. They were rebuking evil spirits. Why aren't we seeing that? You have the authority if you belong to the body of Christ. We have the authority as the body of Christ to live a prophetic witness and to call God's judgment on the forces that oppose his message. Now, I just want to finish with the last little bit as we see the seventh trumpet, it blows. And what we see is the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ. Now, remember we read in chapter 10, there will no longer be delay. Now the kingdom has come in full. Um, and we see this praise to God. It's interesting that that's the seventh trumpet, that God just takes charge. And um, we have to remember that Revelation isn't necessarily written in a strictly chronological fashion. More it kind of, you know, kind of spirals and it'll come back to ideas. But I think right here we're looking at church. You have been called to faithfully prophesy, to give faithful testimony of Christ. You have authority, but the world's going to oppose you. The devil's going to want to destroy you. But you know what? Even in your death, even in your suffering, God is going to vindicate you. God is going to prove that his message is true. God is going to bring down those who oppose him. And finally, God is going to take control and the kingdom of the world is going to become the kingdom of of our Lord and of his Christ. And that is good news for us. It should give us encouragement and courage to be that prophetic witness that we have been called to be. God bless you, my brothers and sisters. 
I hope that this study has helped you. It's certainly been a lot for me. Have a great week.